Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey everybody, Michael here. We are back for a brief-ish analysis of Act 2 of Final Fantasy VI. Just as a reminder, what I'm calling Act 2 covers everything from Terra's first transformation to the end of the Floating Continent event. In Act 1, we spent a lot of time meeting most of the characters and getting to know their super objectives. In many cases, their themes were related. There aren't as many new characters, and there isn't as much new music in Act 2. We instead spend more time developing the characters we already have. Act 2 begins with Locke waking up in the bed in Arvis' house, the same bed that Terra woke up in toward the beginning of Act 1. Interestingly, Celeste gets her first opportunity to look out for Locke here. The party decides to follow Terra, and you can choose who to take with you. If your party isn't Locke, Celeste, Edgar, and Sabin, I'm sorry, you're doing it wrong. They are basically required to get the most interesting story beats. Before the party leaves Narsh, we finally get a chance to explore it a bit. It's been an important part of the story through most of Act 1, but now we can talk to the NPCs and visit shops. It's great to see how much verticality is built into the city on the cliffside. Many of the houses themselves have more levels than most of the houses in the game. The party first travels to Figaro Castle, now above the sand. If you've brought the correct party, Sabin immediately leaves to wander around and explore. If you rest at the inn, we see Sabin exploring on his own and reminiscing. The scene starts in silence, but as soon as Sabin's flashback begins, Coin Song begins. As mentioned before, Coin Song is based on the B section of the Edgar and Sabin theme, but Coin Song includes a new B section of its own. This suggests a little more nuance to the emotional core that I already mentioned when I brought up this song in Act 1. In the flashback, a younger Sabin lashes out at everyone, especially the matron, in the wake of his father's death. This shows his more impulsive side that we saw come out a bit in points in Act 1, like in the battle with Ultros. As part of his lashing out, Sabin says that the Empire must pay, but when he and Edgar are alone, he says that he wants to get away from the war. Sabin is understandably emotional, and Edgar is such a good brother here. We don't see the full extent of this until later in this act. Edgar and Sabin settle the matter of their inheritance with a coin toss, hence the song title. Back in the present day, there is no background music. It's a simple, nice way to show the end of the flashback. Edgar joins Sabin in the throne room. It's nice to see Edgar doubting himself a bit when he mostly seemed supremely confident in Act 1. But my husband and his brother love each other, my heart. Later, it's revealed that not only can Figaro Castle sink beneath the sand, it can travel underground to the desert near Kolingen. When the castle resurfaces, the party visits that town. Here we learn of Locke's former partner, Rachel. She had joined him on one of his treasure hunts, saved him from a rickety bridge, and fell herself. Due to her injuries, she developed amnesia and completely forgot who Locke was. Now we see why Locke reacted so strongly to Terra's amnesia in Act 1. Rachel's father blamed Locke for her injury and told him to leave. Rachel, still not remembering who Locke is, but seeing that he makes her father upset, also asks him to leave. Locke stays near Rachel's house, hoping she will recover. Eventually, someone else, presumably a friend of Locke's, tells him he should move on. We can agree this friend is a villain, right? Locke tells the party that, sometime after that, the Empire attacked Kolingen, and Rachel died in the battle. Her memory had returned just before she died, and she called out to him as she died. I'm not sure how he knew that, though. The old coot at the edge of town embalmed Rachel's body in such a way that it would not deteriorate at all. It perpetually looks like she's sleeping. And the old coot just has a dead body in his basement, no big deal. Celeste, once again, is concerned about Locke here, but she's also perhaps concerned about how she fits into Locke's life with the ghost of Rachel lingering. Similar to the coin song and Edgar and Sabin, Rachel's theme, Forever Rachel, is the slower, sadder version of Locke's theme, played on a solo flute primarily. This brings up an interesting question, though. 
which theme came first. In the first video, I referred to Locke's theme as a mask that he built for himself, since it doesn't really match his super objective. Did Locke build this theme based on Forever Rachel, or was his theme always there in some form? The second idea would imply that Forever Rachel doesn't really describe Rachel, it describes how Locke feels about her. The party quickly stops by Jador, which has some interesting class distinctions to it. Jador isn't a destination at this point, nor is it anywhere in Act 2. It's just a place we're stopping on the way. I'll focus on Jador more when it comes to be a more important location of its own in Act 3. The party then heads to Zozo, the city of liars and thieves. It's cool that it's consistently raining here, and the battles can be surprisingly difficult. The music here, Slam Shuffle, describes the city well, but it's not one of the more interesting pieces on the soundtrack. Even though Zozo is one of my least favorite dungeons of the game, you do get Edgar's chainsaw here. I love that he wears a hockey mask when he uses it. I'm just glad that I remembered the time to set the clock to from my childhood playthroughs and didn't have to talk to all the NPCs to figure it out. The party finds Esperterra in a pad. If for some reason you weren't sure it's her, Awakening playing in the scene should have clued you in. The party also meets Lord Dumper extraordinaire, Ramu. Other than knowledge, from this conversation you get a plan of what to do next, and your first four pieces of magicite. The long tracking shot of the party descending the stairs while they discuss how to get to the Empire is really cool. Keep Edgar and Sabin in your party, just trust me. Back to Jador for another brief stop before we get to the actual destination. Here, in Ozer's house, we learn that Celeste looks a lot like Maria, the opera diva. This is yet another point that I'd want to spend more time developing in my imagined Celeste-led prequel to Final Fantasy VI, but I digress. We learn that the owner of the world's only airship, the wandering gambler Setzer, is planning to kidnap Maria. How convenient. Speaking of Setzer, hey, here's our first new character in a bit. We won't learn this for some time, but his super objective is to make peace with his past. Setzer's theme, which we hear during this brief introduction, doesn't seem to have anything to do with his SO. It does match what we know about him, though. It's fun, exciting, and dangerous. And it sounds like you're soaring through the clouds. So we head to the opera house. Inside, we're greeted with the music for Spinach Rag. We've heard this before, during the tutorial for Gao's Rage and Leap commands. I really liked the music there, but I don't so much here. It seems like it's making fun of opera or of the impresario. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the opera scene later with a guest. So I'll hold off on that for now. There are some important points around the opera scene to discuss though. Though Celeste was starting to soften a bit back in Kolingen, the second anyone mentions she should sing, she toughens back up again. Interestingly, she never verbally agrees to sing, but she does do it. Why the hell is Ultros at the Opera House? If for some reason you were incorrect and you brought Cyan and Gao as your extra party members, you'd have a party of four people that Ultros never even met before. I know he's just a comedic side villain and I shouldn't be paying that much attention to him, but he really bugs me. Some non-musical and non-narrative notes about the opera sequence. The pit musicians and the audience members look really good, but kind of out of place compared to everything else in the game. I love how the music gets quieter when you go to the front of the house. The dressing room scene. Dang, this scene is good. Celeste, bringing up Locke, rescuing her, helps set up her big aria, and it helps solidify why that melody becomes her character theme. Through much of the rest of the scene, they're trying to figure out each other's feelings while trying to hide their own. Celeste asks the excellent question, somewhere inside you were saving her, weren't you? Locke can't answer, so he obfuscates his feelings in his response, that ribbon suits you. Celeste, with no other options, diffuses the awkward situation and talks about the opera. A plus writing here. At the culmination of the opera scene, Setzer abducts Maria, just like he said he would. 
Celeste gets the boys on board, and Setzer wants them off. The party explains why they need the ship, but he says no. Celeste retorts, Stop thinking of yourself. Many towns and villages have been smashed by the Empire. She should know. She smashed at least one herself. Setzer cuts Celeste off to tell her that she's beautiful, and that if she marries him, he'll take them to the Empire. She says yes, and Locke gets so upset. It's almost like he has a crush on her or something. What do you think? Setzer plays right into Celeste's game, though, when she offers that this be settled with a coin toss. Edgar gives her the coin that she flips. It has two heads. Sapin puts two and two together really quickly. It suggested that this is the same coin Edgar flipped to let Sabin have his way ten years ago. Edgar is shown in a much more positive light in Act 2 than he was in Act 1. What I never understood though, why doesn't Setzer call them out for cheating? It does make sense that he's amused that they out tricked him, but still. The more important thing I never understood, did Celeste know that Edgar had a two-headed coin? If so, when did she hear about this? She's not the type to engage in small talk. Setzer is asked if the ship could crash. He replies, when things fall, they fall. It's a matter of fate. Foreshadowing much? Anyway though, the little sequence of flying to the Empire is so cool. On the southern continent, you can explore the three towns other than Vector. Nothing plot-specific happens here, but there are some interesting tidbits of information you can pick up. A woman in Sen, for instance, says that their royal family was slaughtered by the Empire. This is yet more fodder for my prequel story idea. Just as a quick side note, Johnny C. Bad is the music that plays in the rowdy pub in Albrook. It's musically appropriate, but nothing special. The music, when you finally go to Vector and sneak your way into the Magitek research facility, though, is a bop. Devil's Lab has metallic clangs, other strange sound effects, a great bass line, and other melodic ideas that seem to echo throughout the noisy lab. I like how you can spend some time and get all of the treasures from the sprawling research facility, or you can make a beeline to your destination, where Kafka is roughing up some weak espers. It feels strangely violent. He also mocks the espers and teases the existence of the statues to himself? Or is it to the espers that he's about to throw in the dumpster? When the party finally makes its way to the room with creatures floating in tanks, if you for some reason couldn't guess what those creatures were, the music, Another World of Beasts, should clue you in. All of the espers in the facility sacrificed themselves to give their power to the party. Sid, just conducting business as usual, enters and sees what's going on. Sid is an interesting character. I had a hard time nailing down his super objective, but I think it ultimately is to do what's right with an eye toward advancement. It seems, especially at the beginning of Act 3, that the game wants us to sympathize with Sid and think he's a good guy, but he was presumably in charge of magically augmenting Kefka, and then magically augmenting Celeste, even though the procedure had left Kefka with lasting brain damage. He also oversaw the horrible treatment of the espers. We're meant to forgive him, but I'm not sure I can. Kefka also rushes into the scene with some Magitek armored soldiers. He claims that Celeste was working for the Empire the whole time. I kind of wish Celeste didn't have a chance to respond before she whisks the enemies out of the room, leaving Locke with more long-lasting doubts. Speaking of that though, how does she do what she does? The ice magic makes sense, but everyone flying away? What was that? Anyway, Celeste has bought the rest of the party the time they need to escape. Setzer flies us back to Zozo while the track Blackjack plays. It's a freewheeling, fun-loving, cheesy flight theme with a trumpet solo, like most other Final Fantasy flight themes. Back in Zozo, Terra reunites with the remains of her father, Maduin. Being near his magicite helps her remember her past. She is half Esper, half human, and was raised in the Esper world. Another World of Beasts hammers this home. It seems like the game is trying to do something pretty cinematic in the Esper World sequence, but some of it isn't translated well enough to work super well. The little part of the sequence that I do really love is, how do we know unless we observe for ourselves? A sex scene? In my Final Fantasy game? 
But a music shift to the Empire Gestal lets us know that the good times can't last here. The Empire has shown up. Not just the Empire's soldiers, but Gestal himself. It's odd that he himself would arrive. When the music switches to Troops March On, it suggests a time for action involving the Empire. Madonna and Terra slip out of the gate, and Maduan follows them. When Gestal picks up Terra, and Madonna is understandably upset at this, he kills her. Even though the animation is very simple, it seems surprisingly violent. At the end of the flashback, we're clued in that we're talking about Terra again when we hear Awakening. This flashback has actually completed part of Terra's super objective to understand herself. The party flies back to Narsh to discuss everything with Bannon. This time, Terra and the company are welcomed into the city. Since we've been here last, Bannon has achieved one of his goals, to get Narsh on the side of the Returners. Now he wants more power. He asks Terra if she'll go to the sealed gate and speak with the Espers. Awakening accompanies her big decision, but this also now ties to how she knows herself to be part human and part Esper. She agrees, and the party heads back to the southern continent. Not before a quick chase through the mines, though. Lone Wolf has escaped the prison in Figaro Castle and made his way to Narsh. He has a gold hairpin with him, and you can choose to either get the gold hairpin or to save Mog's life. Come on, you saved Mog, right? Now a member of your party, you get to know Mog a little better. Only, not really. He's a character with one of the weakest motivations in the game. His SO is to hang out with his friends. Since Ramu appeared to him in a dream telling him so, the party are now his friends. So now we can head to the Cave of the Sealed Gate. The Imperial base at its entrance is empty. That's odd. This is pretty effectively eerie, especially with how imposing the base looks. The Empire has clearly been camped out here for much longer than they were at Doma. And now it's empty. Not like this raises any red flags or anything. Inside the cave, another world of beasts plays. This is appropriate since we're headed toward the Esper world. There's a bit of a difficulty spike in this dungeon, but that makes sense. For the most part, ice magic does pretty major damage here, even more than Edgar's drill. When you reach the gate, surprise, Kafka has followed you there. And he's also waiting for Terra to open the gate. Does every JRPG have a you've been working for the bad guys part? Metamorphosis plays. It's the first time we've heard this. It's a weird, diminished version of Terra's theme at points. The drums here make it feel really hectic and imposing. Espers come raging out of the open gate, and the gate closes behind them. The party gets back in the airship to follow them. The rampaging Espers also damage the airship, though, and when things fall, they fall. When the party returns to Vector, the city is on fire. It really is kind of disturbing. Returners and Narsh soldiers who came to attack the city are wandering around confused. Bannon basically got what he wanted, though. Though he does have the baffling line in the SNES translation, What are you talking about? Talking with Espers? This is all your idea, buddy. Or did you not want us to try to talk to them and instead just use them as resources? Gestal has thrown Kafka in jail for his crimes, and throws a banquet for the party to discuss peace and next steps. Of course, Gestal just wants to use Terra's power, just like everyone else does. But no human's going to make them sit down and listen, as Sid puts it. Come on, Terra's standing right there. Anyway, I pulled out my trusty strategy guide for the banquet questions. This friend has been with me through a lot. Side note, the music for the banquet? The Returner's theme. Interesting. The party decides that just Terra and Locke will go to search for the Espers. Everyone else hangs out and does some snooping. This playthrough is the first time I ever found Gao in the saloon. He says, Smells like parents' house in here, which is a depressing line. This playthrough is also the first time I went back to the airship to see Setzer's little repair scene. It's cute, and it's nice to get some of Setzer's backstory. The dynamic between Setzer and Sid is fun. But he kind of just tells the whole Daryl story in this scene, doesn't he? When Locke and Terra arrive in Albrook to get on the Imperial boat, the player hears kids run through the city 
instead of under martial law. Even the music is trying to make us feel more comfortable. The pair meets with Leo, who introduces them to Shadow and Celeste. When Celeste enters, she nods her head as if she's never met Locke or Terra before. Leo sets everyone up at the inn for the night. Locke can't sleep, so he goes out for some air and finds Celeste there. Locke approaches her to try and patch things up. This might be my favorite moment in the game. Celeste doesn't say a single line of dialogue, but we hear Celeste's theme playing. This is probably the most operatic moment in the game, even more so than the actual opera scene. The music tells us how Celeste is feeling. It requires that we remember learning this theme during the opera and transfer the emotional content of that scene, the love and the longing, and place it on Celeste in this scene. It asks more of the audience than most scenes and doesn't treat them like they're stupid. This is all capped off with the simple but extremely effective animation of Celeste slowly closing her eyes before she runs away. It's so excellent. The next morning, everyone boards the boat. Leo suggests that everyone relax until they arrive. After a time, Tara talks to Leo. The scene is silent until the conversation begins, at which point Awakening begins to play, so we're clued in that the conversation will focus on Tara. Tara asks Leo for advice. He doesn't mince words, but it seems like he means well. Once again, Tara comes right out and asks, what's with you? He says that he knew that she was being used as a biological weapon. Yikes. She asks, will I ever be able to love someone? Jeez, she's awkward. Nevertheless, Leo responds, of course, without hesitating. In response to her feeling like an outsider, Leo responds, I understand what you mean. I understand only too well. Hmm, what could he mean by this? Perhaps it should be explored in his backstory in a prequel game. Terra seeks the answers to the same questions from Shadow, and his response is actually pretty good. You must look within for answers. However, I don't know what Shadow means to tell her when he says, In this world, there are many like me who've killed their emotions. Don't forget that. Is that some kind of warning? Don't be like me? Or stay away from people like me? Tara exits, and the music changes to what, so we know we're in for a lighter scene from here on out. After barfing over the side of the ship, Locke has a great line to Shadow. Not a word of this to anyone else, O oh shrouded one. The next morning, as they disembark, Celeste now tries to reach out to Locke. He ignores her. Even if this behavior is pretty realistic for how people might interact with each other, it still hurts me when they don't sit down and talk with each other. As Terra Locke and Shadow enter Thamasa, we hear a new theme that will be discussed a bit more soon. It's odd and quirky, which helps set the tone for this little town. Basically, everyone in town is surprised that strangers are there. I love the two little scenes where you spot different people using or almost using magic. The party meets Strago and Realm. It's Strago's theme that we've been hearing, and, like the theme, he's a bit odd. His SO is simple, to live happily with Realm. Realm's SO is basically the same, to live happily with Strago. Realm's theme is so pretty. I love that it stops playing as soon as she closes the door. Watch Interceptor through the events in this town. When the party huddles up to discuss the strange things going on, he joins the huddle with them. It's cute. And more obviously, Interceptor is a fun way to hint at the connection between Shadow and Realm. Later that night, Strago comes to wake the party up as they sleep in the inn. Terra and Interceptor both perk up when Strago says that Realm is in danger. We already talked about Interceptor, but beyond just being a good person, does this foreshadow some maternal instinct for Terra? At the burning house, pretty much the entire town is there, using their magic to try to put out the fire. The old lady even has to rush up to help, it's a cute moment. The next morning, Shadow tries to hide his feelings while everyone else talks. I'm not even sure what his feelings are. When Strago talks about how the mage warriors were hunted down, Terra asks, just because they could use magic? Don't be so shocked, girl. The whole game has been people treating you differently just because you can use magic. 
Terra, Locke, and Strago head to the nearby mountains to look for the espers, and that means we get to hear the Mount Colts theme again, so that's a win. It's so cute that Realm has obviously followed the party there and is trying to sneak around. I've always found it confusing that these statues are not these statues, they're just statues made to look like the statues. Get it? Having the boss encounter in the middle of the dungeon makes it tense. Are we going to face the espers as an enemy? Nope, just Ultros, and he once again feels like a weird aside. So when we do find the espers, it's not immediately clear that there won't be a boss fight with them. Locke even tells Strago to take Realm out of there, and it's interesting that he recognizes that he'd need Terra with him for this. But they end up surrounded by espers, so escape is out of the question. Terra squares up with Yura. Locke's line, I wonder if she's gonna go ballistic again, is rude, but it, it, it is kind of a legitimate worry. But by the end of the scene, Strago is mansplaining to the literal magic beasts how to use their powers. Either way, the espers are convinced to go back to Thamasa with the party. Back at Thamasa, the music is now Kids Run Through the City. It was a smart choice to have this theme instead of Strago's theme. For one, the town secret is now out. Beyond that, this theme helps set us at ease, thus making the upcoming betrayal all the more shocking. Before the betrayal, though, Leo and Yura seem to be moving toward peace, and Locke and Celeste have reconnected and reconciled. Or, they've started on that path, but Celeste asks that they not talk about it. It's progress, but you need to talk through your problems, kids. The sweet moment is interrupted by Kafka's laugh, and then his theme starts. Kefka starts causing mayhem and destruction. I love the brief scene where we get to play as Leo. It's short-lived though, as Kefka kills him. Leo's death feels strangely violent for these pixels that don't show much. It's interesting, but not surprising, that when Kefka neutralizes the Esper's powers, he also kills his own soldiers. Kefka doesn't care, and that just adds to the characterization we already have of him. I like how we don't know for sure whether Kafka is following Gestal's orders here, or if he has escaped from prison and has now gone rogue. But come on, we know. After Kafka leaves, and all the espers are dead, even the ones who broke through the sealed gate to try to save their friends, the party holds a little memorial service for Leo. Terra's line, I... I wanted to learn so much more from you, is a really good line. A wounded interceptor limps in. The party assumes that Shadow is also dead. It's important that Celeste sees Locke bandage up the dog. She says, he was so gentle. Is this line about Leo? Or Shadow? Or Locke? The party in Thamasa is worried about the others on the southern continent, but they show up themselves. Well, Gao and Mog don't come along, because they're not important to the overall plot of the game. I guess they're back on the airship. Realm says something snarky, and Sapin has no patience for her, just like he had no patience for Gao. It's okay, babe. I don't want kids either. Strago and Realm get to join the party officially now. At the end of the scene comes another line from Edgar that I choose to take the Super Nintendo translation as canon. He asks Realm how old she is. She responds that she's 10. Edgar then says, you've grown up entirely too fast. Lighten up, okay? That's how I will forever remember this scene happening. No other translations, thanks. Shortly afterward, we see Gestal and Kefka enter the Esper realm. The Espers left the gate wide open when they flew to Thamasa to save their friends. So clearly, Kefka was going along with Gestal's plans. The track Catastrophe plays as the floating continent rises up into the sky. Catastrophe, by the way, is a reworked version of the very opening of the game. It's been reworked in a higher register and with a flute solo, minus the ominous bell and low brass rumble. Definite downgrade from the first version. Why didn't they just use that again here? Time for the floating continent. You can only take three people, but the game doesn't give you a good reason why. Take whatever party of three you want, but I would suggest you not take Celeste. Just trust me on this one. The party flies to the floating continent as Save Them plays. This works for every high energy action sequence, doesn't it? The action here, with a gauntlet of enemies followed by two bosses in a row, is kind of thrilling. I actually wish the scene were a little bit more dynamic visually to match the music. 
When we land on the floating continent, we hear the music New Continent. It's actually kind of terrifying. Great final dungeon music, wink. On the ground here, the party finds Shadow and becomes a party of four. His first instinct is to look out for Interceptor. When he knows Interceptor is alright, I'd argue that Shadow has a hidden objective for most of the rest of the floating continent. To die. The floating continent is confusing to navigate, but in a fun way. It again makes for a great final dungeon. Wink. Then we come to the battle with Atma Weapon. The music playing here, Fierce Battle, makes this fight epic. This can be a tough battle, but I guess I was just overleveled. After the battle, the music switches to the underwhelming catastrophe. What a letdown after Fierce Battle. Shadow leaves the party, though it's not clear why, and Celeste joins the party, if she wasn't already there. This is why you shouldn't take her with you. It feels a little fishy at first when she joins, and I wish the game played that up a bit. Maybe a party member could say something about being afraid that she'd side with Gestal and Kefka. The other party members are neutralized too quickly in this scene. Gestal is exceptionally creepy here. You and Kefka were given life to serve me. It is your birthright to rule the world with me. Kefka really ups the tension when he says, Kill the others and we'll overlook this treachery. Take this sword. Take care of them. Immediately. Celeste holds the sword and pauses in thought for a moment. Celeste delivers the devastating line, Power only breeds war. I wish I'd never been born. She suddenly swings around and stabs Kefka instead. I love that Kefka freaks out at the sight of his own blood. Kefka flies into a rage and speeds up his work toward his super objective of obtaining the ultimate power. Here, Gestal learns that his SO and Kefka's are different. Kefka, stop it! Revive those statues and you'll destroy the very world we're trying to possess. That, dear friends, is the conflict. Kefka uses his new power to nearly kill Gestal. Kefka really likes kicking dead or almost dead bodies around. Gestal has one last pathetic whimper of, there'll be no one to worship us, before Kefka tosses him off the floating continent. Rip. Things aren't looking good for our heroes, but at this moment, Shadow drops his hidden objective of dying to swoop in and save the party. He says, I'll see you again. Count on it. Which is true unless you don't know how to save him. What follows is another fun action sequence of escaping to the airship. The land breaking up and falling to Earth below is legitimately angst-inducing if this is your first time. I like how all of the enemies in this section kind of look like Kefka. Narapa especially is a cool looking enemy. I got to the point where you have to wait for Shadow with plenty of time. I took a step with only 4 seconds to spare and got in a fight. I was worried that I'd have a game over here, but the game automatically stopped the battle, Shadow showed up, and everyone jumped on the ship. Not like the ship is much good here though, it's ripped in half, as is much of the planet. The view in this scene is so cool. Surprise, the bad guys won! It's the end of the world! <laughs> but second surprise, the game isn't done, we still have one act to go. Now we're going to go back and focus more specifically on the opera scene, especially the music in it. To do that, I'd like to have a friend join me. We're back to talk a little bit more about the Final Fantasy VI opera scene. I am joined by Erica. Hello. And I have Erica here because she has sung the part of Celeste in live performances of the opera scene. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But I just sort of wanted to set up a little bit about the scene. So the Final Fantasy VI opera scene doesn't have any specific plot relevance to the rest of the game, but the emotional resonance of that music, as I've already discussed, is important to the rest of the game for Celeste's character. When we get into the opera scene itself, I find myself wishing that the translator had picked better syllables that matched the melody a little better. The number of syllables in the melody and in the translation don't always line up, at least in the Super Nintendo translation. When it comes to the actual singing parts, I've heard a lot of people criticize the sound effect used for Celeste's voice, saying that it doesn't really sound very good. But I think that makes sense. Celeste is not a trained singer like the other two that have 
singing parts in the opera scenes. So it makes sense in the game that she's not as good of a singer. Doesn't make sense in real life because Erica has a great voice. <laughs> so the last little part that I wanted to point out is to sort of like put a pin in until we get to talking about act three of the game is Celeste throwing the flowers off the balcony. That is mirrored in an important way in act three at some point. And we'll talk about that more when we get to that. Here's where I'll just sort of open up the floor. You can say whatever you feel like about your experience with singing. I was thinking about the importance of this scene for fans of the game, because so many people who loved, loved Final Fantasy VI, I mean, some of them love it because of this scene and its importance later on and how much it does for the story and for the characters in that moment of the game. I first worked on this, well, I first heard it when I played the game in sixth grade, which was 19... <laughs> At the time, you know, I didn't realize its full significance, but then I started listening to it in college. My best friend absolutely loved the game as well, and he sort of reminded me how good it really is. So when I got the chance to sing this, I was like, I will pay good money to audition for this part, and I ended up not even having to audition for it. Um, so I sang this at Wolf Trap Center for the Performing Arts in Vienna, in, in Vienna, Virginia. Thank you. Um, in 2010 with the Distant Worlds Music from Final Fantasy concert series. Now, if you've ever been to one of these concerts, it's just the most magnificent experience. And if you haven't been, you need to go because Distant Worlds, um, Video Games Live, all of these performances that are bringing these soundtracks to life, there's nothing like hearing a full orchestra and full choir singing all of these things. And didn't you get to meet Uematsu from uh, from one of the times you I did <laughs> he he shook my hand he has very soft hands by the way <laughs> I have never had such a fangirl moment in my life <laughs> you were talking about how this is important to a lot of other gamer and music types it was also really important to me as a composer I first played this game when I was 10 or 11 and this scene just like hooked me and it got it's it's sort of what made me want to be a composer especially a composer for the stage okay so moving on with sort of the rest of the scene then so after the big aria we've got the next two parts of the music which are the wedding and the grand finale the wedding is musically really over the top but in a way that's appropriate in how it is referencing bel canto opera and bel canto is just both a style of operatic singing and a period in which operas tended to be in a more similar style, in this bel canto style. The music also suits both the action on the stage with the fight scene happening there and the fight going on in the rafters with Locke and the other two party members as they try to stop Ultros. Then we get to the grand finale when everyone has fallen onto the stage and the heroes are fighting with Ultros on the stage and the orchestra is just like, Let's just go with it and make it a, an entertaining spectacle for the audience. And this music is incredible. I think it's so awesome. And I love all the little moments when the audience is murmuring and like they don't know what's going on before the music starts up. It's it's such a good effect. It's like one of those stage fake outs where they're like, is this a play <laughs> or is this really happening? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think this whole sequence is really, this whole opera sequence is really good. And I think it sort of is interesting in how this sequence of seeing something, something outside of the game that is somehow also telling the story of the game has happened in most of the Final Fantasy games after six. We've got the gold saucer play sequence in Final Fantasy seven. There's something that I, rem that I remember thinking about for eight as being the same idea. In nine, there's the, it happens at the very beginning game of the game and in the end credits with the play happening there. So things that are outside of the game or that are set pieces within the game that are also helping to tell the story of the game at the same time. All right, well, uh, I, I think that's about all that we have to say about this. So thank you so much for joining me for this long video discussing act two of Final Fantasy VI. I'll be getting to Act Three, which is the final act at some point. So there is more game in Act Three than the other two acts, but there's also less story. 
So even though it'll take longer hours wise to play through that, there's less to talk about. So look for that video in some amount of time. We'll have other videos coming out interspersed throughout there. So let me know if you have any other thoughts on this. If do you, did you read anything differently than I did? Did you come to any conclusions that I might have missed or that you think are interesting? Uh, please let me know in the comments. Like this video if you liked it. Follow this channel if you're not following it already. And maintain your groovy selves. See you next time. Bye.